Global governance or world governance is a movement towards political integration of transnational actors aimed at negotiating responses to problems that affect more than one state or region. It tends to involve institutionalization. These institutions of global governance, the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the World Bank, etc., tend to have limited or demarcated power to enforce compliance. The modern question of world governance exists in the context of globalization and globalizing regimes of power, politically, economically and culturally. In response to the acceleration of interdependence on a worldwide scale, both between human societies and between humankind and the biosphere, the term global governance may also be used to name the process of designating laws, rules, or regulations intended for a global scale. Global governance is not a singular system. There is no world government, but the many different regimes of global governance do have commonalities. While the contemporary system of global political relations is not integrated, the relation between the various regimes of global governance is not insignificant, and the system does have a common dominant organizational form. The dominant mode of organization today is bureaucratic rational, regularized, codified and rational. It is common to all modern regimes of political power and frames the transition from classical sovereignty to what David Held describes as the second regime of sovereignty, liberal international sovereignty. In a simple and broad-based definition of world governance, the term is used to designate all regulations intended for organization and centralization of human societies on a global scale. Forum for a New World Governance Reasons for this forum for a new world governance. Traditionally, government has been associated with governing, or with political authority, institutions, and, ultimately, control. Governance however denotes formal political institutions that aim to coordinate and control independent social relations, and that have the ability to enforce, by force, their decisions. However, Authors like James Rose now have also used governance to denote the regulation of interdependent relations in the absence of an overarching political authority, such as in the international system. Some now speak of the development of global public policy. Adil Najam, a scholar on the subject at the Party School of Global Studies, Boston University has defined global governance simply as the management of global processes in the absence of global government. According to Thomas G. Weiss, director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the Graduate Center, CUNY, and editor 2005 of the journal Global Governance, a review of multilateralism and international organizations, single quote global governance, which can be good, bad, or indifferent, refers to concrete cooperative problem-solving arrangements many of which increasingly involve not only the United Nations of States but also other ones, namely international secretariats and other non-state actors. In other words, global governance refers to the way in which global affairs are managed. The definition is flexible as to scope. It applies whether the subject is general, for example global security and order, or specific, for example the WHO code on the marketing of breast milk substitutes. It is flexible enough as to reach. It applies whether the participation is bilateral, for example an agreement to regulate usage of a river flowing in two countries, function specific, for example a commodity agreement, regional, for example the Treaty of Tlaita Lalco or global, for example the NPT. These cooperative problem-solving arrangements may be formal, taking the shape of laws or formally constituted institutions for a variety of actors such as state authorities, intergovernmental organizations, egos, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, private sector entities, other civil society actors, and individuals to manage collective affairs. They may also be informal, as in the case of practices or guidelines, or ad hoc entities, as in the case of coalitions. However, a single organization may nominally be given the lead role on an issue, for example the World Trade Organization, TOE, in World Trade Affairs. Therefore, 
Global governance is thought to be an international process of consensus forming which generates guidelines and agreements that affect national governments and international corporations. Examples of such consensus would include WHO policies on health issues. In short, global governance may be defined as the complex of formal and informal institutions, mechanisms, relationships, and processes between and among states, markets, citizens and organizations, both inter- and non-governmental, through which collective interests on the global plane are articulated, duties, obligations and privileges are established, and differences are mediated through educated professionals. Titus Alexander, author of Unraveling Global Apartheid, An Overview of World Politics has described the current institutions of global governance as a system of global apartheid, with numerous parallels with minority rule in the formal and informal structures of South Africa before 1991. There are those who believe that world architecture depends on establishing a system of world governance. However, the equation is currently becoming far more complicated. Whereas the process used to be about regulating and limiting the individual power of states to avoid disturbing or overturning the status quo, the issue for today's world governance is to have a collective influence on the world's destiny by establishing a system for regulating the many interactions that lie beyond the province of state action. The political homogenization of the planet that has followed the advent of what is known as liberal democracy in its many forms should make it easier to establish a world governance system that goes beyond market laissez-faire and the democratic peace originally formulated by Immanuel Kant, which constitutes a sort of geopolitical laissez-faire. Another view regarding the establishment of global governance is based on the difficulties to achieve equitable development at the world scale. To secure for all human beings in all parts of the world the conditions allowing a decent and meaningful life requires enormous human energies and far-reaching changes in policies. The task is all the more demanding as the world faces numerous other problems, each related to or even part of the development challenge, each similarly pressing, and each calling for the same urgent attention. But, as Arnold Toynbee has said, our age is the first generation since the dawn of history in which mankind dares to believe it practical to make the benefits of civilization available to the whole human race. Global governance is a product of neoliberal paradigm shifts in international political and economic relations. It is a movement towards political integration of transnational actors aimed at negotiating responses to problems that affect more than one state or region. It sends to involve institutionalization these institutions of global governance the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the World Bank, etc. tend to have limited or demarcated power to enforce compliance. Global governance can be thus understood as the sum of laws, norms, policies, and institutions that define, constitute, and mediate trans-border relations between states, cultures, citizens, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, and the market. It embraces the totality of institutions, policies, newels practices, norms, procedures, and intuitives by which states and citizens try to bring more predictability, stability, and order to their responses to transnational challenges such as climate change and environmental degradation, nuclear proliferation, and terrorism which go beyond the capacity of a single state to solve. Examine gaps in the international system for managing complex issues and to engage stakeholders on practical steps for collective problem solving brings together diverse actors to coordinate collective action. Having different perspectives global governance can be defined in numerous ways. Global governance is a process of designating laws or rules or regulations intended for a global scale. It means that there is acceleration of worldwide interdependence both between human societies and humankind in the biosphere. Moreover, it used to designate all regulations intended for organization and centralization of human societies. In that sense, it is also the management global processes and the absence of the global government. According to Thomas Juvies, global governance refers to concrete cooperative problem-solving arrangements, many of which increasingly involve not only the United Nations of states but also other namely international secretariats and other non-state actors. Furthermore it refers to the way in which global affairs are managed which correspondingly explains that global governance is also an international process of consensus, forming which generates guidelines and agreements that affect national government and international cooperation. Global governance is not singular system that governs the whole world. 
But the various sitems of global governance have similarities that is it why it can be said that global governance is not a world government. In a book entitled, Modern Organizational Governance, global governance pertains to the political interaction that is required to solve problems that affect more than one state or region when there is no power to enforce compliance. This definition can be taken in the context of various states' governments having legitimate monopoly on the use of force on the power of enforcement. Let us now proceed to the United Nations. I will now tackle how UN started and what its background. Now President Truman arrives to attend the last session of the conference to mark its official closing, a day which the whole civilized world has awaited anxiously that it might judge results. And the world, as well as San Francisco, rejoices over great progress made. At the Opera House, last hours of the convention, as delegates of the steering committee honor Edward Stettinius, who later resigned as Secretary of State to become permanent chairman of the American delegation. And Lord Halifax calls dramatically for a standing vote on the completed charter. And it is now my duty, my honor and my privilege in the chair to call for a vote on the approval of the Charter of the United Nations. Nation by nation, the delegates stand up for the great new charter they hammered out together. Fifty nations standing side by side, unanimous for peace. Now, final signing of the charter. China signing first as the first nation attacked in this war. Dr. Wellington Koo's signature topping the long list to come. Then for Russia, Ambassador Gromyko commits his country also to the agreements and objectives decided upon. After days and nights of compromise and cooperation, four main agencies upon which the world now puts its hope. A powerful security council having final military authority. A general assembly representing all member nations. A social and economic council to tackle the causes of war. And an international court to judge any international disputes. The signing is done. The great charter is completed. This draft of mankind's deepest hopes already a historic document. Perhaps the Magna Carta of peace-loving humanity itself. Now Stettinius introduces the final speaker of the San Francisco Convention. The President of the United States of America. If we had had this charter a few years ago, and above all, the will to use it, millions now dead would be alive. If we should falter in the future in our will to use it, millions now living will surely die. Now there's a time for making plans, and there's a time for action. The time for action is here now. Today, the Allied world salutes these representatives of 50 nations. They have made a beginning, a brave beginning, that can build a mighty structure for peace. Out of a world of agony and total war has come a charter that must mark a turning point in human history. A new way lies ahead. The world must take this way, through unity and cooperation, to a lasting peace. The name. United Nations, UN, which was coined by then the United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt, was first used in the declaration by the UN of January 1, 1942 during World War II. The UN is an international organization founded in 1945. The mission and work of the UN are guided by the purposes and principles contained in its founding charter. The UN represents the peak of modern globalization. The UN is an intergovernmental organization that is tasked to promote international cooperation and create and maintain international order. As a replacement for the ineffective League of Nations, the UN was established on October 24, 1945 after World War II to prevent another conflict. During its founding, the UN had 51 member states, now, the member states are 193. 
The headquarters of the UN is in Manhattan, New York City and is subject to extraterritoriality. Other main offices are situated in Geneva, Nairobi, and Vienna. The UN is financed by voluntary contributions from its member states. Its objectives include maintaining international peace and security, promoting human rights, fostering social and economic development, protecting the environment, and providing humanitarian aid in cases of famine, natural disaster, and armed conflict. The UN is the largest, most familiar, most internationally represented, and most powerful intergovernmental organization in the world. The UN Charter was drafted at a conference between April and June 1945 in San Francisco and signed on June 26, 1945 after the conference. This charter took effect on October 24, 1945, and the UN began operation. The UN's mission to preserve world peace was complicated in its early decades by the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective allies. The UN participated in major actions in Korea and Congo, as well as in approving the creation of the Israeli state in 1947. The UN's membership grew significantly following widespread decolonization in the 1960s. By the 1970s, the budget for economic and social development programs of the UN far outstripped its spending on peacekeeping. After the end of the Cold War, the UN took on major military and peacekeeping missions across the world with varying degrees of success. Due to the powers vested in its charter and its unique international character, the UN can take action on the issues confronting humanity in the 21st century, such as peace and security, climate change, sustainable development, human rights, disarmament, terrorism, humanitarian and health emergencies, gender equality, governance, food production. Some of the roles of the UN are the following. Maintain international peace and security. Protect human rights. Deliver humanitarian aid. Promote sustainable development. And uphold international law. Maintain international peace and security. The UN came into being in 1945, following the devastation of World War II, with one central mission, that is, the maintenance of international peace and security. The UN does this by working to prevent conflict, helping parties in conflict make peace, peacekeeping, and creating the conditions to allow peace to hold and flourish. These activities often overlap and should reinforce one another to be effective. The UN Security Council has the primary responsibility for international peace and security. The General Assembly and the Secretary General play major, important, and complementary roles, along with other UN offices and bodies. Protect human rights. The term, human rights, was mentioned seven times in the UN's founding charter, making the promotion and protection of human rights a key purpose and guiding principle of the organization. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights brought human rights into the realm of international law. Since then, the UN has diligently protected human rights through legal instruments and on-the-ground activities. Deliver humanitarian aid. One of the purposes of the UN, as stated in its charter, is to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character. The UN first did this in the aftermath of World War II on the devastated continent of Europe, which it helped to rebuild. The UN is now being relied upon by the international community to coordinate humanitarian relief operations due to natural and man-made disasters in areas beyond the relief capacity of national authorities alone. Promote sustainable development. From the start in 1945, one of the main priorities of the UN was to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Improving people's well-being continues to be one of the main focuses of the UN. The global understanding of development has changed over the years, and countries now have agreed that sustainable development, which promotes prosperity and economic opportunity, greater social well-being, and protection of the environment, offers the best path forward for improving the lives of people everywhere. Uphold international law. The UN Charter, in its preamble, set an objective, that is, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. Since then, the development of and respect for international law has been a key part of the work of the UN. This work is carried out in many ways, 
that is, by courts, tribunals, and multilateral treaties, and by the Security Council, which can approve peacekeeping missions, impose sanctions, or authorize the use of force when a threat to international peace and security exists, if it is deemed necessary. These powers are given to the organization by the UN Charter, which is considered an international treaty. It is an instrument of international law, and the UN member states are bound by it. The UN Charter codifies the major principles of international relations from sovereign equality of the states to the prohibition of the use of force in international relations. UN system agencies include the World Food Program, UNESCO, and UNICEF. The UN's most prominent officer is the Secretary General, which is an office held by Portuguese politician and diplomat Antonio Guterres since 2017. Non-governmental organizations may be granted consultative status with the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, and other agencies to participate in the UN's work. The UN has six principal organs, as follows. General Assembly. The Security Council. Economic and Social Council, the Secretariat, the International Court of Justice, and lastly Trusteeship Council. The General Assembly, which is the main deliberative assembly, is the main policymaking and representative organ of the UN. All 193 member states of the UN are represented in the General Assembly, thereby making it the only UN body with universal representation. Each year, in September, the entire UN membership meets in the General Assembly Hall in New York for the annual General Assembly session and a general debate, which many heads of state attend and address. Decisions on important questions, such as those on peace and security, admission of new members, and budgetary matters, require a two-thirds majority of the General Assembly. Decisions on other questions are by a simple majority. The General Assembly elects a president each year to serve a one-year term of office. Under the UN Charter, the Security Council, for deciding certain resolutions for peace and security, has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. It has 15 members, 5 permanent and 10 non-permanent members. Each member has one vote. Under the Charter, all member states are obligated to comply with the decisions of the Council. The Security Council takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to the peace or act of aggression. It calls upon the parties to a dispute to settle it by peaceful means and recommends methods of adjustment or terms of the settlement. In several cases, the Security Council can resort to imposing sanctions or even authorize the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. The Security Council has a presidency, which rotates and changes every month. The ECOSOC, for promoting international economic and social cooperation and development, is the principal body for coordination, policy review, policy dialogue, and recommendations on economic, social, and environmental issues, as well as the implementation of internationally agreed with development goals. It serves as the central mechanism for the activities of the UN system and its specialized agencies in the economic, social, and environmental fields, thereby supervising subsidiary and expert bodies. It has 54 members that are elected by the General Assembly for overlapping three-year terms. It is the UN's central platform for reflection, debate, and innovative thinking on sustainable development. The Secretariat, for providing studies, information, and facilities needed by the UN, comprises the Secretary General and tens of thousands of international UN staff members who carry out the day-to-day -day work of the UN as mandated by the General Assembly and the organization's other principal organs. 
The Secretary General is the Chief Administrative Officer of the UN, who was appointed by the General Assembly on the recommendation of the Security Council for a five year, renewable term. UN staff members are recruited internationally and locally in work and duty stations and on peacekeeping missions worldwide. Serving the cause of peace in a violent world is a dangerous occupation. Since the founding of the UN, hundreds of brave men and women have given their lives in its service. The International Court of Justice, the primary judicial organ, is the principal judicial organ of the UN. Its seat is at the Peace Palace in The Hague, Netherlands. It is the only one of the six principal organs of the UN that are not located in New York, United States of America. The court's role is to settle, following international law, legal disputes submitted to it by states and to give advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by authorized UN organs and specialized agencies. The Trusteeship Council, inactive since 1994, was established in 1945 by the UN Charter under Chapter 13 to provide international supervision for 11 trust territories that had been placed under the administration of seven member states and ensure that adequate steps were taken to prepare the territories for self-government and independence. By 1994, all trust territories had attained self-government or independence. The Trusteeship Council suspended operation on November 1, 1994. By a resolution adopted on May 25, 1994, the Council amended its rules of procedure to drop the obligation to meet annually and agreed to meet as occasion required by its decision, the decision of its president, or at the request of a majority of its members or the General Assembly or the Security Council. Understanding the United Nations is key to understanding international politics. For one, many of the most controversial conflicts in recent history can be partly traced to actions sanctioned by the UN. For example, the Israeli-Palestine conflict materialized due to a UN partition of Palestine, and in the 1950s, the United Nations approved of a US-led intervention in the Korean War. So how exactly does the United Nations work? Well, the whole purpose of the UN is to promote cooperation between nation-states. As of 2016, there are 193 members. Notable non-members include Taiwan, Kosovo, and Palestine, which is recognized as an observer state. The structure of the United Nations is laid out in its founding document, the United Nations Charter. This document describes the process for legislative, judicial, and executive processes. Primarily, decisions are controlled by the United Nations system, which is composed of six principal organs and various specialized agencies. The General Assembly is the main legislative branch, and all member states have equal representation within it. Meetings of the General Assembly usually focus on resolutions, which are non-binding recommendations, which at least 50% of the United Nations members recognized as important to international affairs. The General Assembly also controls the budget, and in doing so will decide how much each member is compelled to spend to keep the organization alive. A controversial aspect of the General Assembly is a consequence of the equal representation. This one-state, one-vote system potentially allows a resolution to pass with two-thirds support by nations that only comprise 5% of the world population. The Security Council is possibly the most controversial of the six organs, however, and for a good reason. This organ oversees international security matters, including peacekeeping operations and United Nations membership. There are five permanent members of the Council, for reasons that I went over in this video, but there are also ten non-permanent members who are voted on by the aforementioned General Assembly. Unlike the decisions made by the General Assembly, Security Council resolutions are meant to compel military action from its members. Relatively recently, however, the Security Council failed to authorize the United States invasion of Iraq, calling into question the effectiveness of its binding agreements. The administrative work of the United Nations is done by its Secretariat. The Secretariat is responsible for the drafting of official documents and preparing the budget voted on by the General Assembly. The head of the Secretariat is the Secretary General, who acts as a de facto spokesperson for the United Nations. At the time this video is published, the Secretary General is Ban Ki-moon from South Korea. The International Court of Justice is the primary judicial body of the United Nations. It settles disputes between members that have recognized its authority on the matters. If a member refuses to recognize the authority of the court, the matter may be brought to the Security Council. The court is composed of 15 judges, trained in international law and voted in by the General Assembly. The Trusteeship Council is a principal organ, but has been inactive since 1994. It was responsible for preparing trust territories, or countries that were formerly under the control of sovereign colonialists, for proper entry into the community of Indian independent states. After Palau became independent, the body was declared extinct indefinitely. 
Finally, the Economic and Social Council decides how best to coordinate the United Nations specialized agencies. The specialized agencies carry out actions not normally associated with any other organ and are centrally focused on the development and expansion of trade, economic growth, and social unity. The Economic and Social Council holds 54 members and is led by a president voted in for a one-year term. Among the specialized agencies include the International Monetary Fund, which promotes economic prosperity, and the World Health Organization, which aims to reduce infectious disease. In addition, the Food and Agriculture Organization has a goal to defeat hunger worldwide. In 1990, nearly one in five people worldwide were undernourished. Now that number is less than one in nine. And while we can't say that the United Nations is completely to thank for this drastic reduction in hunger, its continuing mission to strengthen ties with countries and break down barriers between people certainly hasn't made hunger worse. The function of the UN. Similar to its function in the past, the main function of the UN today is to maintain peace and security for all of its member states. Although the UN does not maintain its military, it does have peacekeeping forces that are supplied by its member states. On the approval of the UN Security Council, these peacekeepers are sent to regions where armed conflict has recently ended to discourage combatants from resuming fighting. In 1988, the peacekeeping force won a Nobel Peace Prize for its actions. In addition to maintaining peace, the UN aims to protect human rights and provide humanitarian assistance when needed. In 1948, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a standard for its human rights operations. The UN currently provides technical assistance in elections, helps improve judicial structures and draft constitutions train human rights officials, and provides food, drinking water, shelter, and other humanitarian services to peoples displaced by famine, war, and natural disaster. Finally, the UN plays an integral part in social and economic developments through its UN Development Program. This is the largest source of technical grant assistance in the world. The World Health Organization, UNAIDS, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, the UN Population Fund, and the World Bank Group also play essential roles in this aspect of the UN. The parent organization also annually publishes the Human Development Index to rank countries in terms of poverty, literacy, education, and life expectancy. Global Governance in the 21st Century Global governance was created to explain an increasingly complex international system. It refers to the loose framework of global regulation, both institutional and normative in nature, that constrains behavior. It consists of numerous elements, including international organizations and law, transnational organizations and frameworks, elements of global civil society, and shared normative principles. It refers to the institutions, organizations, laws or principles, agreements, treaties, and codes of conduct in the international system that control or limit the conduct of processes, flows, interactions, and actions or behaviors of international system actors. This international system lacks a global government that wields authority or enacts laws that are followed by members of the international system, states, private organizations, and individuals. Global governance, according to Adil Najm, is the management of global processes in the absence of a global government. Global governance necessitates some degree of organization and comprehension among key actors in the international system of the need to regulate interdependent relationships on a global scale. It is not easy to set priorities among the many challenges of today because everything is interrelated. Their complexity calls for new approaches suitable for dynamic, integrated systems evolving through constant innovation in technologies, forms of communications, patterns of organization, and institutional frameworks. The challenge for mechanisms of governance at all scales of human organization is to accompany and steer these processes to ensure the common good, thereby setting limits that prevent being captured by the already rich and powerful for their benefit and ultimately ensuring a just society that guarantees the well-being of every person on the planet. The challenges of global governance in the 21st century include the following. Environmental challenges. In the scientific community, the major areas of urgent concern are climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. For example, the global carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels have grown at an average annual rate of 2% since 1990 and hit record levels in 2018, thereby reflecting the continued growth of the global economy. A considerable increase in energy consumption was observed in China, accompanied by the weakening of natural carbon sinks, such as forests and seas. 
Large volumes of the Arctic ice have melted an accelerated flow in Greenland glaciers and is contributing to rising sea levels at present. Social challenges. Unemployment is one of our most important social challenges because it drives exclusion and marginalization, with consequences including increasing crime, drug trafficking and use, juvenile delinquency, family breakdown, domestic violence, and migration in search of better opportunities. Meaningful employment is essential for human dignity and a place in the community, and work in a spirit of service to the community has important benefits, including refining human character and empowering individuals to develop their human potential. No one should be deprived of the opportunity to work, and one purpose of good governance should be to guarantee this opportunity. Neither governments nor private actors have found a solution to this challenge at present. Some have proposed a guaranteed minimum income. While this can be an effective tool to alleviate poverty and provide a safety net for vulnerable groups, it does not address the problem of unemployment and the associated waste of resources. Work is necessary for individual and social health. Economic challenges. One economic challenge is the growing risk of a global financial collapse when the present debt bubble bursts. The global economy has no lender of last resort. No reliable, depoliticized mechanism can deal with a financial crisis at present. Whether a country receives or is refused an International Monetary Fund IMF, bailout in the middle of a financial meltdown is a function not of a transparent set of internationally agreed rules but of several other factors, including whether the IMF's largest shareholders consider the country to be a strategic ally worth supporting. No effective international legal framework exists to ensure that global business enterprises are socially, environmentally, and economically responsible. Security challenges. The global economy has never had higher levels of productive capacity, and average life expectancy is at an all-time high. Hence, the potential costs of global war are also at an all-time high. The rewards of war among states, that is, loot, land, glory, and honor which for many centuries propelled nations to war, have given way to populations in search of growing prosperity, social security, and various forms of protection. Military conscription is on its way out in most countries and is no longer regarded as an obligation of citizenship. The state's role in globalization is complicated, in part because of varying definitions and shifting concepts of globalization. While it has been defined in a variety of ways, globalization is commonly understood to be the fading or complete disappearance of economic, social, and cultural borders between nation-states. Several scholars have proposed that in a globalized world, nation-states that are naturally divided by physical and economic boundaries will become less relevant. The state's role in globalization is complicated, in part because of varying definitions and shifting concepts of globalization. While it has been defined in a variety of ways, globalization is commonly understood to be the fading or complete disappearance of economic, social, and cultural borders between nation-states. Several scholars have proposed that in a globalized world, nation-states that are naturally divided by physical and economic boundaries will become less relevant. Because of strengthened interstate relationships and dependence on one another, globalization has altered the political role of the state. States were created with the intention of being self-governing. However, as a result of globalization, states frequently cede sovereignty through conventions, contracts, coercion, and imposition. Because states now make political progression and regression together, this phenomenon has resulted in increasingly similar jurisdictions across states and power being economic rather than political progress, causing states to become increasingly developmental.